Welcome to the third video of the Isaac Lab Reinforcement Learning series. In this tutorial, we explore the direct workflow for reinforcement learning environments. After having already covered the manager-based workflow in the last tutorial, which allowed for a more modular approach, the direct workflow provides more control. As we don't rely on manager classes and instead directly implement the logic within the execution script, I highly recommend watching the last tutorial on the manager-based approach as we have already covered many functions and terminologies, for example, Markov decision processes and how they correlate with the reinforcement learning algorithm. We also keep the same card poll task to focus purely on the workflow. This script will allow us to later create a gymnasium registry, similar to the ones you may know from OpenAI. These registries enable us to link RL libraries like SKRL and algorithms like PPO to our simulation. This will be covered in the upcoming video. Before diving into the code, I want to highlight some important updates regarding Isaac Sim 4.5 and Isaac Lab 2.0. Both have recently undergone a major restructuring, which includes changes in path names and directory structures. These modifications affect how we access certain modules and configure our environments. For a complete breakdown of these changes, along with a step-by-step -step installation guide, check out my latest video, where I walk through everything in detail. As this and future tutorials will be based on Isaac Lab 2.0, please keep these updates in mind. Now, let's jump into the script, which you can find under the updated path shown here. We start by importing the necessary modules. The first three are for math operations, including math, sample uniform, and torch. The latter is also important for tensor computations, autograd, and just-in-time scripting. We have two helper modules, annotations, which prevents undefined name errors, and sequence, which helps define ordered collections like lists or tuples, making our implementation more flexible. Then we find some already familiar ones. Our card pole articulation configuration, which we covered before, as well as the simulation and environment setup modules. Lastly, we import the direct reinforcement learning environment configuration, which acts as the base class, as we will see in a moment. The first class is the card pole environment configuration which inherits from the DirectRL environment configuration. Here, we define all the components that we will use later. We start with the environment settings, which remain unchanged from the manager-based approach. The decimation parameter defines the rendering steps per environment step. The episode length is set to 5 seconds. The action scale is set to 100, mapping the agent's outputs to force values. The action space is 1, meaning we have only one value for the action output which is the force applied to the cart. The observation space is 4, representing the cart and pole's positions and velocities. The state space is 0, leading to a symmetric actor-critic architecture. More on how these work in future videos. Now, we set up our simulation with a physics step rate of 120Hz and a rendering step rate of 60Hz. Next, we define our robot configuration, which is an articulated cart pole. The prim path definition with a star as the regular expression allows us to clone multiple environments. Then we specify the cart and pole's prismatic and revolute joints. We use the interactive scene configuration to specify that we want to use multiple environments evenly spaced between a certain distance. If physics replication is enabled, all cloned environments share the same asset instances, known as USD primps, in the simulation. We then define reset conditions, for example, resetting the cart once it exceeds 3 meters and setting the initial randomized pole range in radians on every reset. Finally, we set our reward weights, which remain the same as in the previous manager base example, with a positive reward for staying alive and negative rewards for termination and deviations. These are designed to encourage the card pole to balance itself. Now, we set up the card pole environment, inheriting from DirectRLNV with a configurable render mode. By default, it is set to none which enables rendering but does not return any output. If set to RGB array, it returns frames as NumPy arrays. The environment initializes by retrieving joint indices for the cart and pole, allowing precise control over their movement. It also stores references to joint positions and velocities, ensuring efficient state updates during simulation. The action scale is set based on the configuration, determining the force applied to the cart. Inside the same class, we define the setup function, which initializes the card pole articulation, sets up the ground plane, and clones the environments. Here, copy from source is set 
to false, allowing changes made to the initial environment before cloning to propagate. We also disable collisions between the environments while allowing collisions with the global prim paths, such as the ground. Then we register the articulated robot to the scene and finally add a light source using a dome light configuration. Now we come to the Markov decision process settings, starting with the actions. Here, we first prepare our actions before the physics steps. These actions are sampled from a Gaussian distribution, where the policy network provides a mean value and a learned standard deviation to introduce variability. The resulting action is then scaled to produce reasonable forces. Afterward, we apply our actions by setting the joint effort and specifying the joint index. Then we get our observations, which are concatenated and grouped under a dictionary called policy. This step is necessary for the model's input. Next, inside get rewards, we compute our total rewards using the compute rewards function. This function is defined outside the class at the bottom of the script. It uses a torch script decorator for efficient just-in-time computations. The function takes in all necessary arguments to calculate the rewards. The reward for staying alive is determined by multiplying a scaling factor with a logical check. If the environment is still active, the value is 1. If the episode has terminated, it is 0. A similar approach is used for the negative termination reward, but with inverse logic. Additionally, there are penalty terms that discourage excessive movement. One for the pole's angular deviation, another for cut velocity, and one for pole velocity. These penalties help guide the agent towards stable and controlled movements. Now, let's look at the two remaining functions inside the class. The first one, getDones, tracks the completion status of environments. Before doing so, we update the joint positions and velocities from the simulation. The first flag tracks timeouts by checking whether the episode duration has exceeded the allowed number of steps. The second flag, called out of bounds, checks if the card's joint position exceeds the predefined limit of 3 meters. The third flag works similarly but applies to the pole's angular position. If the pole tilts beyond 90 degrees from its upright position, it is considered out of bounds. These conditions are combined using a logical or operation. The final function is reset index, which resets environments based on their indices. If specific indices are provided, it resets only those environments. Otherwise, it resets all environments by calling the parent class's reset function. Next, we retrieve the default positions and velocities of the joints. The pole's initial angle is randomized within the predefined range, which in this case is 0.25 multiplied by p, resulting in random values between negative 45 and positive 45 degrees. Then, we retrieve the default root state and adjust the root position to the global origin. This ensures that each card pole spawns in the correct place in a multi-environment setup. After this, we update the internal buffer for positions and velocities before writing these values into the simulation. This update happens at every reset. First, we update the first seven indices, which correspond to the card pole's pose in the simulation, including its position and rotation quaternion. Then, we update the remaining indices, which represent the card pole's center of mass velocity and angular velocities. Finally, we update the position and velocity joint states in the simulation. Since we have already covered the compute rewards function, this script concludes with the final function definition. To execute this script, we will launch it using the train.pi script, which will immediately begin training the card pull task. In the next videos, we will take a deeper look at how this is set up. We will also register the environment with the gymnasium interface and integrate reinforcement learning algorithms. So, in this tutorial, we explored how the direct workflow allows for fine-tuned control over RL environments by scripting rewards, resets, and observations manually. While this method provides a structured workflow and performance benefits, it is less modular and requires more effort compared to the manager-based workflow. If you found this video helpful, consider subscribing for more content on reinforcement learning. Leave a comment on what you'd like to see next. See you in the next video.